Everybody good? Excited to be here? How many of you glad the parking lot's clear? Yes, you and me both. So glad that we could make it to church today. Uh, how many of you are praying for no ice tonight? Say amen. amen. I'm ready for it to be over. This was all I needed. I'm good. Kids got to go sledding. I got to drink hot chocolate while it snowed outside. I'm out. I don't need anything else. So uh, ready for springtime? Bring it on. Uh, I'm so glad that you're here this morning. Uh, just glad you decided to make time to make the trip, get up when it's cold. I know it's easy. The enemy can whisper in your ear. It's just cold. It's fine. But uh, you chose to come out. And so thank you so much for doing that. Uh, a couple things before we dive into the sermon today. Uh, is uh, we have next track that are our classes that you can sign up for uh, in February and March. Those are live now on our website. So if you go to rlclive.com, you can find those there under connect. Uh, just look at the top header. It'll say connect and, and it'll give you the options of what you can sign up for, for either the month of February or the month of March or both. And uh, I challenge you to do that. I challenge you to get involved, get signed up, get involved in either an extract. But really today, let me share this with you. I know Aaron mentioned it and I want to just reemphasize it. Our church grows not because our Sundays are amazing. Our church grows because people get involved in life groups. We grow deeper spiritually, we grow deeper in our relationships, and out of those relationships comes growth because you gain confidence in sharing that faith, you gain confidence in sharing who we are as a church. So I challenge you, go sign up for a life group. Uh, I also want to challenge you and I want to tell you this, church people are creatures of habit. Say amen. amen. See? <sighs> Just follow right along, okay? We... we we are, we are creatures of habit, and so a lot of times we get in this habit of life groups of going, well, I'll just show up, I'll just go to the life group. I have a principle that it's a leadership principle, and I believe it's something that we've seen, and it's true. We cannot change what we do not track. And so in order for us to be able to impact our community, to know where we need life groups, to know what life groups are growing to the point where they need to multiply and have additional life groups, we need to know where you're going to end up. And so I appreciate you just saying, I'm just going to show up and they can figure it out from there. Thanks. <laughs> but we would really love you to let us know on the front end so that we know, so that we can begin to pray over God. Where do you want us to go next? What expansion do you want us to do? And so please, today before you leave, if your goal or your plan is to be involved in life groups, then I need you to stop by the Connect counter, stop somewhere and get signed up. You can do that online. Um, you can do it out there. But we want you to get signed up for life groups. And you say, well, Pastor Vince, my, I wasn't planning on signing up for groups. Why not? Now, that's the only reason, that's the only thing I'll say to you is why not? There, there's nothing that you need more in your life than Jesus, and there's nothing more encouraging than a room full of people who need the same thing, and that's Jesus. And so I challenge you, get involved in a life group, get signed up, do that today. Next week, I believe, is our launch, and we're going to have a big old party. We're going to have a lot of fun, but we need you to get signed up so we know what to expect. Hey, if you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter 2. That is the only place we're going to be today, and we are going to live right there, okay, the whole day. We're going to do it Bible study style. How many of you are okay with that? We're just going to go through, read some scripture, and uh, you all pray for Dom today because he has to stop here and there just when I'm preaching, and, and he doesn't get to just roll through the scripture text. So pray for him as he tries to stay with me today. Uh, we started this series a couple weeks ago, and in this series, we brought up a really kind of clear point. And the clear point was this. We said, and whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then he follows that verse in verse 23 of Colossians chapter 3, and he says this, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. I want you to do me a favor before we dive into the sermon today. Would you bow with me? Everybody just bow with me. We're going to pray this morning. We're going to ask God to be with us. We're going to ask God to open our, our, our hearts and our ears and our minds to receiving what it is he has for us today. Father, we love you. And God, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy and for your love. God, I pray that as we go into this sermon time, God, as that we go into your word and we begin to listen to what it would say to us, that we would hear it clearly, and God, that we would apply it to our lives. God, we thank you, we give you praise, we give you honor, we give you hope. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So this morning as we dive into this, 
Philippians chapter 2 is where we're going to be. I'm just going to start at verse 1, and I'm going to read through. Now, here's the, here's the kicker. I'm going to preach a little bit be, before chapter 12, or before verse 12, but I'm reading all of it. So y'all just hang with me, okay? You can follow along on the screen, or you can follow along in your Bible, but we're going to dig into some stuff here that Paul calls us to, to the church of Philippians. So here we go. So... If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being, this is to you and I, of the same mind, having the same love, being in one accord and of one mind. If you notice how important he says for our mind to be right, he says it twice. Be of the same mind, and then at the end of the verse he says be of one mind. So it's important for you and I to get what Paul is trying to say here. He's like, hey, this is what the church is supposed to look like. This is what the people of God are supposed to look like. And we're not just supposed to look like it on Sundays when it's easy, when we can all lift our hands singing holy or worthy or Jesus you alone, but we're supposed to look like it at all times. And so as we walk into this text, I want you to understand that Paul is writing to a church first and foremost. Now, if you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus. And when I say that, let me clarify it. I'm not saying you don't know about Jesus. I'm saying you don't know him. Uh, Most everybody here, you probably, if, if you grew up in this country, you're familiar with Christmas stuff. You're familiar with the Easter stuff. You might be even familiar with some stories from a vacation Bible school that you got put on a van when you were little and you went to. And so you know about Jesus, but you may not truly know him yet. And today I hope, I hope that you hear something that sparks your heart. Something that just maybe draws you to listening, that God may be calling you today. I've said it multiple times. I believe that today, someone who doesn't know Jesus is going to meet him for the very first time. I just believe that. I believe the text is that powerful. And I believe that Jesus and that God and that Paul wrote it better than I can preach it. So we're just going to let them do the work. Amen? Amen. So we see Paul as he writes this. He says, now, I want to dive into you, church, a little bit. I want to give you some some pointers. And so he keeps going. Have this one mind among you. It picks up in verse 3. And he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. How many of you know this is already going to be hard? He keeps going. Let each of you look, or excuse me, let each of you look not only to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Having this mind, remember we said it in the first verse, having this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now, I love that Paul adds this because it gives me hope, because Paul knows me well enough to know that I, if, if I am using my own mind, <laughs> I'm not getting there. How many of you have some group of people, some person in your mind, some, some specific group of people in your mind that it's really hard for you to think of them above yourselves? Oh, we would never, we would never say that, but we all know it, right? Because when you say it, you have to confront your bigotry, you have to confront your racism, you have to confront your your classism, you have to confront all those things. And if you notice the text where Paul writes in this, he, he's pretty clear when he says, do nothing from selfish ambition, but in humility count others. He doesn't specify which others, he just says others. He doesn't say that you and I get to count ourselves higher than, than the thief or higher than the, the sinner that we all know, the, the, the past that they have, the, the brokenness, the baggage, the stuff, the shame. We, we don't get to say, I'm better or I've, I've just had it, I'm, you know, I, I'm not that. You know, that Pharisee, well, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like these people. But whether we want to admit it or not, we all have it. And we all do it. I won't ask you to say amen there because I just know it's true. As good a people as you may be, as I believe that I am, there are still moments that I don't have humble, non-conceited, unselfish thoughts. There are moments I look at people and go, why do you do that? 
There are people that I go, well, if they would, if they, I can't believe they did that. Well, I, you know, those people, how many of you know those people? I don't have to define it. We all have them. Man, if this, if this is what I would do to those people, I'd put them here and this is what I would do. And we have a long list of all the things we would do to punish those people, forgetting that you and I may be someone else's those people. And Paul says, hey, place others above yourself. Hey, Paul, could you do me a favor? Because I'm going to need a list of which others you mean. Right? I mean, whether we, whether we say it or not, we do this. God, I need a list. Can you give me a list? Because I'm going to need some people to dislike. I'm going to need some people to make myself feel a bit better about myself. So if you could show me who that is, God, that would be great. But he doesn't. And then he comes on and he explains it in verse 5 when he says, Have this mind among you, which is yours in or because of Christ Jesus. In other words, that passage says, I'm going to need you to think about people through the filter of Christ Jesus' mind that's in you, not through the filter of your mind in you. Because I can't get there without Jesus. Come on, somebody. That's the truth. I just can't. I'm too flawed in my own ways. I'm too, I, I struggle too much in my own ways. I need the mind of Christ in me so that I think right, that I think with compassion, that I think with, with joy, that I think with the, the thought that they may not know. Remember, the, the actual mind of Christ from the cross said, Father, forgive them for they, they don't know. And yet I stand here in judgment of a broken world and never give consideration that they may not know. I just assume. So Lord, forgive me in the moments that I do that and give me your mind, your mind. And then Paul in this passage, he goes off to, to give you an idea of Christ's mind, of who the person of Christ is. He gives this really beautiful story of what Jesus does for us or what he does in us. And so it picks up in verse five and it says, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be held on to, a thing to be grasped. But instead he emptied himself. What did he empty himself? The seat in heaven. Sitting on the right hand of the Father, he said, no, 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 I could stay right here. But if I stay right here, then they won't have the option to get here. So he emptied himself of that glory and he came to earth. And he came to earth not as God, not stepping one foot on the mountain and one foot in the sea, not riding in on a white horse, but being born as a servant in the form of a man. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Always it's interesting to me because to the point of death would have been a really good place for a period. But there's not a period there. There's a comma there because Paul knows he's writing to a group of Roman people. And he says, but I need you to understand that it wasn't just that Jesus died. How he died mattered. Because all I, there has been a lot of people in this world that have lived a great life and then it just ended. There have been a lot of people in the world that have done great things and then their life ended. But Jesus humbled himself and lived a great life and then it ended with him paying the punishment for not great lives. Even death on the cross. And imagine when the Romans read this or the Philippians read this, they went... Oh, because they knew the cross. The cross was not just an instrument to kill you. It was an instrument to embarrass you, to shame you, to put you in front of the world, to let the world know that you were worth less. We don't care that you're naked hanging on a tree for everyone who passes by to see. We don't care that you're beat to the point of being unrecognizable. We don't care because it's your shame that puts you there. It was your sin that put, this is what you deserve. Yet when we read it, we know he didn't deserve it. Yeah, I know Jesus died for my sin. No, please don't lessen it for that. Jesus didn't just die for your sin. He took your place on the cross. 
He died not just for your sin, but for you. On your behalf is why he hung there. And then he looked out and he saw you in the midst of your worst moment. I know a lot of people tend to think Jesus sees us here. Like we rolled into church and God saw me here. I came to church this morning. Jesus sees me on the front row raising my hands or he sees me praying or he sees me swinging by the coffee shop, high-fiving some. That's, that's not where he saw you. He saw you in the gutter. He saw you passed out. He saw you with that one that isn't your spouse. He saw you in your anger and your rage. He saw you in your bitterness and your unforgiveness. He saw you there and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know. They don't know. Even death on a cross. Now, therefore, when Paul writes this, he's saying, because of this, God exalted him, is what the scripture says. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him. This is like one of the most preachery verses in all of scripture. Like, it's hard not to stomp a little bit when you read this part. Because like this gets you wound up. He says, he bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. And every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Some of you ain't even preachers and you wanted to stomp a little bit, huh? Some of you went, why do you get so excited about that? Because without it, I'm nothing. Without it, I'm nothing. I also get excited about it because a lot of people miss it and don't understand the reality that this passage is going to happen for everybody throughout history. Well, no, no, there'll be some people that don't, they, they don't accept Jesus Christ, Pastor Vince. Oh, I know, but there won't be a day in eternity that passes that they will not bow their knee and confess who he is. Because whether they do it here in this life living or they do it at their judgment, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So again, the choice gets put back in our place, in mine and your position to where we choose whether we want to proclaim him now or we wait till all it is is a confession and not a repentance. And so when Paul's writing this, he says, I want you to understand that because of what Jesus did on the cross, God elevated him and said, this name will be above every name. This name will be why people surrender and come to me. This name, this moment, this Jesus will be why heaven gets more full. And so then Paul comes back and he says, because of this, because of this, I love it. This is amazing. Pastor Vince, when I think about what Jesus did for me, it gets me a little excited inside. It gets me all, I either get real warm and fuzzy and people, I know I grew up in church, so you always had the people that got, they affect, Jesus affects people differently. Amen? Some of you are shouters. Not a lot of you. Wish I had some more. Need some shouters in here. Anybody? All right. Some of you are hand raisers. Not all of you. Some of you during worship are slow dancers. Some of you that your girlfriend is a slow dancer, you join her. Some of you know what he did. And that without it, there'd be no hope. There'd be no hope as good a person as I like to think I am. I'm nothing without Jesus. Nothing. And I'm a pretty good dude, like I think. I mean, I like to think of myself as a pretty good dude. Compassionate. I love people. Most people. I'm just being honest. Right? Because we do this as as good people. Because I look around, I don't think any of you like showed up this morning going, I wonder what kind of heinous crime I can commit today. Like, that's not you. But we tend to start believing our own hype and we forget that without Christ, none of that matters. 
And so God said, because of what Jesus did, I'm going to set him up. And then Paul said, because of what God did and who Jesus is, I need to give you some instruction. And so he does. Starting in verse 12. Therefore, because of what we just read, my beloved, <laughs> I love Paul. This is what Paul's doing. He's going, my beloved. You sat here. <laughs> He's going, my buddy, my beloved, I'm about to punch you right in the face. <laughs> That's what he does. Because Paul, Paul, doesn't, Paul doesn't step on people's toes. Y'all been in church for like, boy, that preacher just stepped all over my toes. <laughs> That's not what Paul does. Paul crawls up in your lap and drops elbows. Like, hey, I need you to get this. And what he's about to say is not easy. What he's about to say is not something that you can just go, oh, that's good for somebody else. It's about to get all in your plate. He says, because of who God is, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, I love this because this is made for Monday stuff. He says, not only when we're all together in church, but even more so in my absence, Monday through Saturday, even more so. So like, it's okay here. Like, it's safe space, right? We can raise our hands. We can shout Jesus. We can do, it's safe space. Try that on Tuesday, right before lunch break at work. Well, then it starts to get uncomfortable, right? He says, in my absence, Work out, live out your own salvation. Live it out. You need to be working this thing. Work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. And then he keeps going. For it is God who works in you. In other words, don't be depending on yourself to do it because you'll drop the ball on it. He knows me. He knows me well. Happened this week. I was helping Jennifer at the house. She said, hey, I'm going to mop in here. Will you sweep the living room? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll sweep the living room. I go in there with the broom, sweep the living room. I took four dustpans. To, now, I'm not telling you how dirty our house is, but here's what, I, here's what I do. Like, here's what I do. I sweep like a little pile, then I put it in the dustpan, then I run to the kitchen. And then, how many of you know man clean is different than woman clean? See, Jesus knows me. Jesus knows me. It's why this verse is in here. This, I believe, work out your own salvation in fear of trembling. For it is God that has to work in you, Vince, because if, if I'm depending on Vince on his own, probably not going to get what I need. You're probably going to mess this up. So depending on God who works in me, both to do his will and to do his work. Why? For his good pleasure. All right, so Pastor Vince, how am I supposed to live this salvation out? How am I supposed to be this example, this vessel of Christ? How am I supposed to do it? Here it is. Do all things. Just a question. How many of you know some church people that have disputed in the past? That have grumbled? I'll just back it up. How many have you have been the church people that have grumbled, that have disputed? I've sat, I grew up in it. I grew up, I watched... I've watched churches split over whether or not we changed out the ceiling fans. I've watched churches vote on whether we paid an electric bill or not. I didn't understand that. I'm like, don't we have to pay the bill? Like, I feel like electric's a pretty big deal. Like it. But what it was is people couldn't let go of the control, and so when they didn't have control, they grumbled, they disputed, and they fought. Let me ask you this, church. How many of you would love to have the reputation that politicians have? That's the same reaction I got in the 830 service. <laughs> Let me ask you something. Do you realize and understand that to the world, 
It's the exact same reputation the church has. That we can't get along. That we'd rather judge people than love people. We grumble and we fight over everything. And Paul says, do everything. Do all things. Remember, I told you earlier, the whole thing of this was Paul was saying, and whatever you do, do it with thanksgiving. And whatever you do, do it heartily. And here he's going, and whatever you do, stop complaining and grumbling. Stop fighting over things that may or may not matter. He says, this, this is what stops you. Why, why? But Pastor Vince, I gotta share my opinion. No, you don't. <laughs> That's so hard for us, isn't it? As Americans, we tend to feel like we have a right and we forget that what we have is not a right, but a privilege. And privileges can be abused. And the church, frankly, has done a good job of doing that. I'm not preaching this morning to beat you up. I'm preaching this morning to show you some hope because Paul gives it to us. He says, this is why you must do that. Listen, that you would be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. So that among whom you shine, you shine as lights to the world. The world is supposed to know. Let me, let me back that up. Your world is supposed to know whose you are. And not just because you have a coffee cup that says I can do all things through Christ. But because your life is a light and a beacon of the grace of Jesus that is within you. That's why that's so, the world is supposed to know. Oh, Pastor Vince, I'm just doing what I can to get to heaven. You know, the Lord saved me and I get to go to heaven. Listen, I'm so glad you get to go to heaven. But if you got saved simply for the transition from here to there and didn't get saved understanding there is a transformation that has to happen here, you missed it. You missed it. And what I feel is, and what I fear is, that I, we've been singing songs about going home so long we forgot. We still live here. And the world needs to see transformation in us. They need to see things changing in us. So whether you're a believer and you have just gotten cold to understanding that God has something for you, or you're a person here this morning, you don't know Jesus. Oh, you're here, and I'm glad you're here. And man, I don't want you anyplace else. But maybe you're here and you're not understanding that just being here doesn't get you in. That just singing the song won't do it. In fact, the scripture tells us that not all who say unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter in. <clears throat> King Agrippa, Acts 26. You read that this week, right? Where Paul gets this opportunity to preach in front of him and he says, this is the gospel. This is who I was before I met Jesus. This is how I met Jesus. And this is what the gospel has done in me. King Agrippa looks at Paul and says, almost, almost you have persuaded me to become as you are. And Paul had to leave and not knowing whether the king said yes to Jesus. Or almost, I'm close, but I'm not quite there. I believe my biggest fear as a pastor, and I see this because I watch how Paul ends this. And I love how Paul ends it because it tells me that he's a pastor. He says, you were to shine. You were supposed to be without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights to the world, holding fast to the word of life. And then the pastor comes out in him. I know that because I, I understand his last phrase in this passage. I understand it because I asked the same questions on Monday or Sunday afternoon or Sunday mornings between services. Paul says, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I didn't run in vain. Here's what Paul is saying. Did anything I say mattered? 
did it really, did, did people really change or did they just amen and walk back into the same life that they've always lived? Were they more concerned about transitioning to heaven than transforming their life, which is what I died for them to do? Was to be changed, to go from death to life. Did they get it? Paul is writing this church going, I hope you got it. I hope you got it that this life can be different, that your life can be different, that there could be hope and there can be joy and there can be answered prayers and there can be peace. Because here's the thing. When you get to heaven, guess what? You're no longer a witness. It's here that you are the witness. It's here that your life causes other lives to change. It's here that you being a light in a broken and twisted and perverse generation, it's here that that makes all the difference in the world. It's here in your business. It's here in your class, in your workplace, wherever you are in the car line, in the bus line, wherever you are in Walmart or wherever you are, it is there that the promise and the life of Christ shines through you. Now the question is, and this is what Paul is asking to the church, is it? Are you being the light? And I get it. I understand. The world is so bad, Pastor Vince. The world is so broken, Pastor Vince. But you are not Christians. You are redeemed. You are purchased with a purpose. You are bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and you have been changed. But does your world know it? Does your world know that you've been changed? Or are you just as bad about grumbling and disputing through the week? Or are you just as negative as the next person? Are you just as bitter and unforgiving as the world around you? There's no way I could tell. Well, they, you know, they got a bumper sticker. Pretty sure they rock out to Caleb during the week, but... But what if God called you to more? I'm pretty sure. Listen, I love, I love Jesus, and I am not perfect. Don't, don't think this is me up here giving you a sermon that God did not rake me over this weekend. But I am positive he did not die on a cross so that you'd know the words to a worship song. He died on the cross so that your life would change, so that you would have hope, and so that you would share that hope to a crooked and, crooked and broken world. And I pray, like Paul, that the words that I preach, that the sermons that are filled in these journals that I keep are not in vain, but that you change. I want you to bow with me, church. And I want to ask you a question. Christians, you first. I know heaven's going to be great. And let me just be honest with you. As I get older, I can't wait. I can't wait. I'm excited about it. But this morning, I got to hang out with my grandson at the back of the church service. And as unbelievable as heaven is going to be, God has given me a call to be the light to him in a world that is crooked and broken. As much as I can't wait for heaven, some of you walked in for the first time today, and whether I knew you or not, I did my best to high five you. Why? Because God has given me a call to be a light to you in a crooked and broken world. Christians, does the crooked and broken world know that you have been redeemed? Do they know? Or have you talked about it? And they're kind of aware and you've kind of leaned on the fact that, you know, I'm saved, but I still got some stuff, and yet you never change the stuff. The 
this morning you have an opportunity to repent. I know that's a harsh word and people don't like it. The reality is it's what I had to do. And I had to say, Lord, I'm sorry for not being the light that you called me to be when you've called me to be it. Oh, it's easy on Sundays. It's easy in his presence. But when there's no one around, am I still proclaiming Christ? Am I still living Jesus? And so Christians in the room, now's your chance. Do you need to come forward and ask God to change your heart? God, transform me. God, transform me. Change me. God, I, I know I'm transitioning to heaven when the day comes. That I don't doubt. But Lord, I need you to transform me while I'm here on this earth. I need you to change my heart and my mind so that I look and I act and I sound more like you. Jesus, I need you to transform me. If that's you, come on. Come on. You know, you don't have to sit there and wonder. You know if what I just said is you. And you can wrestle with it or you can submit and just go, Lord, here I am. Lord, here I am. For the rest of you, then maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe you know about him. Maybe you've heard the stories, but you, you've never been told that this Jesus, this sacrifice, this cross, that when he hung there, that story that you heard on Easter, that he was seeing you. In the darkest moments of your life, he was seeing you and he loved you enough to bear the cross. He loved you enough to say, I'm still going to go. But they're going to fail you. I'm still going to go. They're not even going to look to you until later, but I'm still going to go. Why? Because if I don't go, they'll never have the chance. So this morning, let me ask you simply, if you're here this morning and you have never said, you have never asked Jesus Christ to come into your life and be the Lord of your life, come on. Come on. I, I know you might, you might have sang the songs. You may, have been, you may even be in a life group. You may be leading a life group. But you have never stopped and said, Jesus, here I am. To, Lord, I accept you as the Savior of my life. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that God raised you from the dead. And I confess that I am a sinner that needs a Savior. If you have not done that, come on. Come on. Slide out of your seat. Come pray. Come get it straight. You can know before you leave. Listen, I'm going to tell you how this works. You're going to take a first step, and it's going to be hard. Because you're gonna, the devil's going to tell you everybody's watching. Ain't nobody looking around. It's going to be hard. I, I, I don't want, if I stand up, everybody, the people next to me are going to see. The people next to you have been praying for you. The people next to you have been praying about it. They've been asking. They've been saying, hey, I hope whoever's here that needs to hear Jesus today, hears Jesus today. Don't worry about the people next to you. Worry about the one in front of you, the one who is calling you. And he's saying, it's okay. You take that first step and it'll be hard. And that second one's going to be easy. By the third one, the only destination you will see is the altar. Come on. Come on. Slide out of your seat this morning. Come kneel before a mighty God. Come on. Come on. Take a step. There's going to be people here to pray with you. We're not going to leave you alone. But listen, I cannot, I cannot leave knowing that you heard and didn't move. So let me ask you this way so I know to be praying for you. Pastor Vince, you're asking a lot. I'm a little scared. It's okay. Would you do me this favor? Would you do this for me? If, if who I just described is you, you know a lot about Jesus, but you may not know him. You don't know that you, you just don't know. Pastor Vince, I don't know where I stand with Jesus. If that's you this morning, would you do me this favor? Would you just lift your hand up and put it right back down? Just lift it up and right back down. I'm not gonna come get you. I'm not gonna come. I see you, come on. Come on. If it's you, just lift it up and back down. Don't, don't worry. I'm not going to come and get you. I just want to pray for you. I just want to lift you up to God. If it's you, come on. 
let me ask you this. This is the last time I'm gonna ask this morning. Wouldn't you like to know? You don't have to know how to do it. You don't have to have all the Bible answers. You don't, listen, here's the, you don't even have to have your whole life straightened out. In fact, there's not a person in the room that does. Not a one of us has it all figured out. But you can leave today and know that you said yes to Jesus and you can hang on to that. Come on. Last call, come on, take a step, slide out of your seat. If you're scared to come alone, grab the person next to you, say, come with me. I don't know what I'm getting into, but I think I'm supposed to move. Come on, I don't know you. What you're feeling right now is not because Pastor Vince has been reading your mail, it's because the Spirit of God is saying, hey, I got something for you. Come on. We used to sing the song, I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Till you know that it's him that you need, this world will be a labor. It's gonna be a fight the whole time. And he's calling you, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you'll open it, I will come in and I will sit with you and we will have fellowship together. I've been doing this long enough to know that he is beating on the door of some of you right now. He is beating on the door. Please open it. Please open it. Father, I pray that your conviction would rest on this place. I pray that your spirit would move, but it would rest on those that are fighting right now. That they sense it, God. There's this push and this pull, and they just don't know what to do, and it's okay. They don't know what they don't know. So I pray that you'd continue to convict them, God, that they would come find somebody after church, find one of the staff members, one of the team leaders, one of the worship leaders, God. They'd go find somebody out in the hallway. They'd find somebody this week. They'd... God, I pray that your conviction would rest in their home till they open the door. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.